Communication. Communication can only take place if, if you allow the client proper time to express thoughts and feelings. And this is one of the things. This is one of the things that we're talking about. The more you talk, the less they're talking, and the more they talk, the more they're getting their point out, and that's important. Oh, there it is. Uh, silence is good for the client as it allows them to garner their thoughts, allows them to think, and thinking is, is really important as far as this guy is or this individual is concerned. They need to think, and, and we, we need to allow them to, to get their words out. Many practitioners are uncomfortable with silence and they want to fill it uh, with their own voice. Um, uh, if you've ever been around somebody from the East Coast, a lot of times they don't like silence. They don't. There's always noise. I was watching a movie this weekend. It was, um, it was a French film. And uh, one of the things that was going on, this lady was uh, uh, always filling the air with noise. So she was in her hotel room and it was silent. So she turned on the radio to fill it with noise. Uh, she was standing there with, with uh, thinking about something. Uh, she opened the window and it was really noisy outside. And so we, as I'm watching this movie, there's like five minutes of her standing there. I, all I could see is her back with the window open with all this noise coming in. And that was it. I mean, it, of course, was a French film. So <laughs> you, <laughs> there wasn't anything happening except for all this noise. Uh, and it wasn't white noise. It was, it was pretty nasty. It was trains going by, train whistles. and and cars driving by and honking their horns and revving their engines. Uh, it was not white noise at all. Anyway, so we need to allow them to, uh, to think uh, so that they can, uh, uh, maybe they'll tell us about their feelings if we're lucky. Even when practitioners are fully focused on listening, they may misinterpret the, the client's words. Uh, the client may use emotional words differently because of their cultural or familial imperatives. Uh, in some people's families, they don't talk about emotions. In some people's families, they talk about emotions, but they don't feel the emotions. They just talk about them uh, as if they had them. They're not actually having any emotions. Anyway, so this is one of the things that you have to remember. Uh, who is the person that I'm talking to? Is it possible that they're from a family that doesn't talk? Um, my neighbors, when I was growing up, uh, my family, we talked all the time. There were eight of us mom, dad, and then there were six kids, and we used to talk all the time. Uh, but we talked about substantive things. Uh, we didn't, uh, we, we talked about politics, we talked about what's going on, we talked about all kinds of really neat things when, uh, when I was growing up. But uh, when I went down to visit my neighbors, my neighbors didn't talk to each other. They yelled at each other. So, and nobody would listen. Uh, and so they had to yell in order to be heard. And even when they yelled, sometimes they weren't heard. So uh, when I went down there, I didn't say anything. And they, they thought I was mute. Because I didn't, I didn't yell. I didn't know how to talk. <laughs> Obviously, there's something wrong with me. Because <laughs> I didn't know how to yell. And so no, and they would ask me a question, and I would just talk in a normal voice. And they would act like they couldn't hear me. Because they weren't used to normal conversation. They were used to yelling back and forth. As weird as that is. But that was that family. Uh, and they never talked about anything important. They certainly never talked about feelings, but they never talked about anything important. It was always, uh, I think the pig's going to, I think the sow's going to have her, have her piglets uh, next week, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, they never talked about politics. They never talked about anything substantive. Uh, interpretation must be explained by the client. Uh, the client has to tell you these things. Uh, and you can ask them the, that question. What was it like uh, in your family when you, while you were growing up? Uh, was there, did you talk about your feelings? Uh, did you talk about this? Did you talk about that? And potentially, of course, the more you talk to them, the more you understand where they're coming from. And this is extremely important as far as a counselor is concerned. What the client says affects the practitioner, and you have to understand this. If they're talking about uh, uh, emotions, 
uh, then potentially those emotions are going to come out in you as well. And so you need to be able to interpret what they're talking about. It is important for the practitioner to listen to their own responses as a way of further understanding what the client is saying. Uh, so sometimes you have to answer, and at, those point, at that time you need to figure out what you're going to say. Hopefully you will already figured this out anyway. If a client is speaking in a monotone about something very sad and the practitioner does not experience any personal response to this, it is important to determine whether the client is allowing himself or herself to feel the feeling where the practitioner is detached. And of course, you don't want to be detached. You want to understand what the client is saying. But if they're talking about something very emotional, something that should make them cry, or something that should make them angry, and they're talking about it in a monotone, then you need to detect that, and you need to tell them. You're, you're, you're not using uh, a normal voice. You're not using a voice that most people would use when they're talking about the death of their mother, they're talking about the death of a child. Uh, you're speaking as if you were talking about uh, as you're talking about the apple you had for breakfast. You're not, you're not putting any emotion into this at all. And if you don't recognize this, then you missed it. You missed something because they're trying to control themselves. They're trying to control what's going on. And you need to tell them that. Uh, you're, there is a lot more control going on here. And you need to understand what's going on. Warmth is expressed through uh, demeanor, your demeanor towards somebody, uh, concern, showing concern, uh, acceptance of the other individual. I keep talking about respect. If you don't respect your clients, you can't help them. If you don't like them, then you can't help them. And this is what happened down south. Uh, we had all these white social workers uh, who had gone to school to be a social worker, uh, but they didn't like black people. White people in the South sometimes don't like black people, don't like the African Americans that they live around. Uh, when I was living in, where was I? Mississippi. Uh, it was really kind of weird. I grew up around black people. I, you know, I love everybody. I'm just that kind of a stupid guy. Uh, but uh, and I'd be walking down the street and uh, I would say hello to whoever I came across. It didn't matter whether they were black or white or Hispanic. Uh, I would say hello to everybody. Well, I was told not once, but many times by people, white people that were walking with me, that I wasn't, I shouldn't make eye contact with the black people. They hate us, they said, and uh, if you make eye contact with them, it just aggravates them. Of course, I was saying hello, and of course, when I was walking with with my black friends, uh, and when I was saying hello to white people, they wouldn't say hello back to me if I were walking with a black person. As, and that's the way it sometimes is in the South. Anyway, so when the social workers were trying to deal with their black clients, they didn't like them. They didn't respect them. Uh, they made fun of their names. And if you watch old movies from 30, the, 20, the 20s and 30s, well, 30s and 40s, uh, you see this in some of the movies, uh, uh, the way that they treat African Americans in those movies. So you, you need to accept your client, no matter who they are, no matter what they smell like. No matter what their clothes look like, you still have to accept them for who they are. Uh, your tone of voice will show warmth. Uh, your posture, are you sitting up? Are you comfortable? Uh, are you stiff? If you're stiff, of course, your posture is showing them that... Uh, um, your posture is showing them that you, you may not like them very much. Uh, when I was in the military, um, <laughs> I used to get in trouble. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, you stand at attention when the general comes in. Of course, you always stand at attention. Uh, and then he says something like, at ease or whatever. But you're not really supposed to go, you're not really supposed to be at ease. And I took him at his word. When he said, no, go about whatever you're doing, I went back to whatever I was doing. I wasn't supposed to do that. I was supposed to stand at parade reps instead of, yeah, I know. And it was stupid, and I kept getting in trouble for this. They kept telling me, no, go ahead, this is, and of course, I'm, I'm saving people's lives here with whatever I was doing. Uh, so I would go back to what I was doing. And of course, the general would be uh, insulted because I, I wasn't paying attention to him. I was trying to save somebody's life. 
as stupid as that is. I should have, but journal is far more important than that person's life. Uh, of course, you, so your posture. I used to get in trouble for, because of the way I was standing all the time. Uh, listening carefully, uh, touch can be a way of expressing warmth when used appropriately. Uh, I like, I, I'm a toucher, I like to pat people on the back. Sometimes, and I'm getting better at this, at, at 70 years old, I've, I've finally almost just about figured out when to touch people and when not to touch people. I'm, I'm getting much, much better at this. In the old days, I just pat anybody on the back, and sometimes, you, some people you can touch and some people you can't. Some people don't want to be touched. Some people, if you pat them on the back, they think you're attacking them, or you got a knife or something, I don't know. Anyway, and of course, when you're talking about uh, males and females, uh, the, the rules are completely different. Uh, if you're on the athletic field, uh, you can pat somebody on the butt, but don't do that unless you're playing baseball or something, or playing basketball. So, you know, you can't really <coughs> pull those stunts. So you have to be really careful as to who you can touch and who you can't touch. Who was I talking to the other day? We were. We, we ran into each other, we kind of ran into each other, and, and he said, oh, you're probably okay, and he patted me on the shoulder, and I patted him on the back, and we were okay. I was at Walmart, I ran into this guy. Anyway, we didn't know each other, I mean, it was that kind of a deal. <laughs> but I figured to, if he patted me on the shoulder, I had him on the back. He didn't punch me, so I guess I'm okay. <clears throat> the appropriate expression of warmth can depend on many diversity issues, uh, gender influences, how warmth is expressed particularly. Uh, this is influenced by various religious or spiritual beliefs. Um, warmth, how, how do you show warmth uh, to select individuals? Uh, is anybody a Lutheran? Any Lutherans in here? Lutherans are kind of cold. That's not very nice, is it? <laughs> I used to have a colleague that, that taught counseling, and he was a Lutheran minister. He was a fascinating guy. Lutherans are about as cold-hearted as anybody you can possibly imagine. Lutherans are, are it's, it's really an interesting religion. Their religion believes in balance. So they hate to be happy, because if they're happy, they know they're going to be sad. <laughs> so they've got no expression on their faces at all. Uh, if you ever watched a Swedish film, nobody smiles in a Swedish film. Well, why don't they smile? Well, if you smile, that means you're going to be frowning to balance everything out. You think I'm kidding. This is weird. Go to a football game against a Lutheran school. It's, it's weird because they don't cheer very loud. And they're not really happy at the end of the game if they won. It doesn't, because they know that if they're happy because they won, then they're going to lose the next game. I mean, that's the way they feel. So they don't show any emotion. It's just the weirdest thing in the world. You can't make them laugh. The more they laugh, the more they're going to cry in the future. You know, everything is balanced. So they hate to win money because they know they're going to lose money in the future. It's just the weirdest religion in the world. Anyway, so warmth may have a lot to do with, uh, with the religion. Uh, a lot of Christian religions are not very happy religions. Uh, the pe people aren't all that happy. Um, <clears throat> so this is one of the things that you need to think about. Racial and ethnic differences in cultural norms influence the expression of warmth. Uh, the power differential, my dad grew up in a family of people that were, my aunt was an evangelist, so his, his family was, I mean, they would go to revival, they would hold revivals, that's how they made their money during the Depression. They built people out of their pennies. For 1995, I'll send you to heaven. Okay, one of those kind of deals. It was my aunt. <laughs> So my dad was funny, you know, he, of course, he didn't, we didn't go to church, and my mother, my mother didn't believe in that kind of stuff, uh, but every once in a while, it would just come out of him, uh, because, you know, you, we'd be sitting at the table, and I'd be telling all these jokes, he'd say, that's enough humor. Really? Is there ever enough humor? <laughs> but that was, it would just come out every once in a while. He was okay. He was fine. Normally, he laughed along with everybody else. But you didn't want to laugh too much because if you laugh too much, then you're going to be crying. I know. It's, How do you live like that? 
If you live like that, that's hojo. Come on. It's balanced. It's everything in balance. It's a weird different kind of balance. Uh, well. <laughs> Have you ever been around Catholics? Uh, they're all the same to me. Oh, see? you got to got to ask him, what church do you go to? No. And here's the weird part. Irish Catholics are different than Polish Catholics, and they're different from Italian Catholics. I mean, it's just the most bizarre thing in the world. I used to live in Omaha, where it's, a, it's like 80% Catholic. But, you know, you've got... Over here are the Italian Catholics and Slovakian Catholics. And it was just strange, because <coughs> they, they worship different <coughs> saints. And some of them, sometimes they're happy and sometimes they're sad. You can't make an Italian happy to save your life. My goodness gracious, every But with the Italians, it's more serious because the whole thing of the Catholic culture is the whole the Vatican. Well, yeah, but it's... And it's, it's not that they're doing the different saints. It's every saint is for something different. It's for something different and it's for a different Saint area. Saint Francis is supposed to be for happiness. Yeah, but... St. Michael is supposed to be for uh, protection in his war. Well, that's one of the reasons why Pope Francis, you would think Pope Francis would be very, very popular. And he is. The South Americans love him. The uh, people from Central America love him. But there are some Europeans. He's just not serious enough for him. I mean, the Italians don't like him. Uh, Polish don't like him. Um, the Irish... Mm. And you got St. Patrick. Like it was actually, he was a priest, and supposedly he drove all the snakes out of Ireland. Yeah, drove all the sna snakes out of Ireland. That's pretty happy. And the Irish are pretty happy people, as compared to Germans. They're German Catholics, too. The German Catholics live in uh, southern Germany. And there's French Catholics, of course. But the French don't control, they don't control the Vatican. They don't control the Catholicism like other yes. countries do. Oh, Spanish yeah. Catholics, Portuguese. Uh, Portuguese Catholics. I mean, it's just really their. They all have different um, ideas. Eastern European Catholics, ugh, ugh, different, you know, kind of grouchy. Anyway, so we need to understand all this stuff. You, you need to understand just because somebody's Catholic doesn't mean they're going to be unhappy. So maybe they're going to be. Maybe they're Irish Catholic. Maybe they're they're South American Catholic. So they're going to be a little bit uh, different. So we need to, to, to figure this out. We need to talk to them and get all this information uh, uh, that, because we need to understand this stuff. The power differential between different people can confuse how expressions of warmth are interpreted uh, between a child and an adult, a, a doctor and a patient, or a person with perceived economic power with one who does not have this. Uh, in the United States, money is important. Uh, in some places, money's not that important. You have to remember, if we're talking about Western, uh, Western people, uh, we're talking about a Europe which was controlled by an aristocracy. And it still is to some extent. Uh, Sweden still has a, a king. Uh, Netherlands have a queen. Uh, England, of course, has a queen. Uh, there are royal families in Greece. There are royal families in Spain. They're not in charge of the country anymore. But they're still there. So the economics power uh, is interpreted differently in different places. In the United States, there is equality in the United States to some extent. If we're all middle class, but what if somebody's an upper class person? Do they have a different personality than somebody who's middle class? Or somebody that's lower class? Or somebody that's working class? And if you, when you take the cultural psychology class, all this will... You'll, un you'll start understanding the difference between uh, people of different classes. The one class we don't talk about is the upper class. These are the hidden people in the United States. These are the people with all the money. This is what Bernie Sanders keeps talking about. This is what uh, Elizabeth Warren is talking about right now. She wants to, she wants to, to uh, put a 2% tax on all the money that people make over $50 million. Well, I have never known anybody that made that much money. But I've been around people that were, yes, I have. I've known people that made over $50 million. They have different mindsets. They really do. They think that everybody's after their money. They're paranoid. It's a, it's a, but it's a natural paranoia. 
If you've got it, you think everybody else wants it. I wish I had something that anybody else wanted, but I can't think of anything. My wood, I've got, I've got a stack of wood that's like this tall. <laughs> that's like 11 loads. It's all stacked in a big pyramid. They're going to come over and tell me to stack it. I know they are. <laughs> anyway, okay, so economic power has a lot of uh, power in the United States. It's one of the reasons why some people like Trump and other people just hate him. They really don't like him. And the reason is because he acts like a rich person. He is a rich person. And he's always been rich. So he's always, everybody's, they, everybody has done things for him hoping that they'd get a little piece of the pie. That's what I know. It's weird. It's just weird. And he keeps doing strange things. But we've never had somebody with this kind of money before as president of the United States. Someone told me, oh, he doesn't have any more money anymore after he became president. I was like, what about Trump Towers? Doesn't he like have a whole business thing? He gave up on that to become president. And I'm like, no, he did sure? Well, that's the whole point. He did. I heard he's not taking a salary. He's taking a salary or no? No, he's not. He's not taking a salary. He does, well, yeah, he doesn't need it. Theoretically, he's got billions of dollars. Why would he take $100,000? Trump change to him at this point. Trump change, <laughs> exactly. It's Trump change. The expression <laughs> says be genuine, uh, so don't try to fool anybody. It ain't going to work. Uh, due to the way that the brain functions in thousands of years of history, individuals are quickly able to pick, uh, pick up warmth that is not genuine. Okay, so, and of course my kids figured this out. Uh, their, their mother was, you know, giving them kisses and hugs and whatnot, but she didn't live with them. She didn't like them that much. Uh, so she didn't fool them at all. She didn't fool my kids at all. So my kids knew how much she liked them and how much she didn't like them. And when we went to Germany, we, we uh, went to Germany after I married Karen. It's one of the reasons I married Karen, so I could get to go to Germany. <laughs> when we went to Germany, of course, my, my ex-wife didn't come to Germany to visit us. So we didn't, the kids didn't see her for three years, and they didn't seem to miss her at all. Because, as she do, oh, come here and give Mommy a kiss, you know, that kind of stuff. How old were your kids? Uh, when we went to Germany, let's see, that was in 79. Uh, so Chris was born in 72, he was 7, and my daughter was born in 69, so she was 10. So at that age, they can pick it up? They can tell? Oh, them. kids can pick it up right away. I mean, babies can pick this stuff up. Mm -hmm. Babies will want to be held by a certain individual because a certain individual gives them warmth. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with, with soft and, and hard. Um, my kids wanted me to pick them up because I would hold them and I'd hold them against my shoulder even though I'm kind of a bony, muscular, you know, let's pretend I'm muscular. My wife was a lot softer than I was, but when she held a kid, her muscles were all tense, taut, they were taut. And so she wasn't a very, it wasn't very comfortable for the kids to be with my wife, be around my wife. That's right. Do you think it's body language or pheromones or? I don't think it's pheromones because some people don't have pheromones. Some people don't put off pheromones. I think it's probably body language, sure. Uh, it's how you hold them, uh, how much support you're giving them. Are you giving them proper support? You know, I, you, know you, you watch some people, they'll pick up kids like this and they don't hold them against their bodies. Is that uh, why babies cry like when a different well, they can. They have different smells. They have different, lots of different things. So yeah, I mean, if I picked up a, a kid right now, I mean, if a baby walked past, if somebody walked past with a baby, and I went out and grabbed a hold of the baby, if I, you know, I took and I held it against my shoulder, potentially the baby would cry because I'm so much different than that, and they're not used to that. But if I held it correctly, then potentially the baby would be okay. I've known babies that would only, they only wanted one person to touch them. Yeah. It just, it made me think about um, another spectrum of things, like uh, how abusers can pick out people.
people who would be good victims. Exactly. They can hone in on them really quickly. That's an excellent point, and, and that's something that I have never read, but you know, you were absolutely correct. They know who their the their next victim is. But bullies exactly. Good at it. Sure. They can look at somebody and tell if they're afraid just by looking at them. Uh, men who seduce women. I think that's a lot of bullies a target. Just kidding. <laughs> A lot of times, um, a man that's a sexual predator, he'll go into a party with a, a lot of different women around, and he'll be able to pick out the one that is um, uh, ready to be seduced, is primed to be seduced. He can tell if she's attracted to him by whether her, her eyes dilate or not. When you're attracted to somebody, your eyes dilate. Can you really see that? I heard that too, but can you really see sure it? Sure you can. On the dark. <laughs> it doesn't matter how dark it is, you can still see. Their eyes are black. Of course they can. That's scary. It is scary. It should be scary because this guy is a predator. And he's he, he knows that you're attracted to him or that you like him or that you're positive toward him. And, and he can uh, talk you into things. He'll be able to talk you into things. A good predator will, will will go home with somebody every night. If he's, do you think these things get passed down? I think it probably what probably happened is that uh, he was successful with a select individual. Uh, then he was successful the next night with a select individual, and then in his brain he's formed a pattern. He, yeah, there was a pattern, and, and he's looking at this individual, and now he knows by looking at their eyes, whether they're attracted to him or not. Yeah, as ugly as all that is. Keep losing things. Okay, there it is. <laughs> level one, okay, warmth evaluation scale. Level one, the practitioner communicated little or no concern for the client. Uh, they appeared cold, detached, stiff, or mechanical. And that's level one. It's the lowest level, of course. Level two. Oh, I'm sorry, level three. We go to one, three. We can count. At least half the time, the practitioner verbally and non-verbally communicated concern and caring appropriate uh, to the unique needs of the client. Uh, that's level three, so that's not bad. Certainly better than level one. Level five, the practitioner's facial expression and posture consistently communicated concern and caring uh, appropriate to the unique needs of the client. And so that's what, that's what we're aim, aiming for, uh, level five. <coughs> Some individuals don't want to be connected with. Some individuals came in because they thought they had to or they thought they wanted to, but then they realized they didn't. So sometimes level five is impossible with select individuals. The individual wants, needs to want to communicate with you in order for that to work. Now we're going to talk about a movie that I saw over the weekend. It was a French movie. <laughs> it was really an interesting movie, and I didn't, while I was watching it, I'm going, oh my God, she's just standing there. Jeez, and what's into all the noise? Oh my goodness gracious. But once I started watching the movie, I kind of got into what was going on. There was a lot of empty stuff, but that was the whole idea. It was a movie about loneliness and emptiness and depression. And this is the expression the lady had throughout the entire movie. There was only one time when her, her facial expression wasn't like she had been decapitated. No facial expression at all. She ran into uh, a new lover, she ran into an old lover, um, and the entire time that uh, they're interacting, um, this, is, this is the look that she had on her face. Wait a minute, there you go. Yeah, I, I think somebody decapitated her and put her head back on her shoulders. That's the look she had throughout the movie. It's called The Meetings of Anna, and it's about her interacting with people. Now, the weird thing is, people would just come up to her and start talking, but her expression never changed. I mean, if you saw somebody that looked like this, what would you diagnose them with? Of course, they diagnosed her as loneliness, but I mean, loneliness is not, it's an idea, not a, not a feeling. So what would you diagnose this lady with? 
If she came into your office and this was the facial expression you saw. <laughs> Detachment or something like that. She's certainly detached. Depression? Yeah. Uh, Remember, depression. sadness is one thing, but sadness has movement to it. And this lady, there was hardly any movement at all. I mean, it was throughout the whole movie. That was her expression. She did a really good job. She smiled one time during the movie. She was about to be seduced by an old boyfriend. And they had had a conversation about, uh, you know, a few moments we'll, we'll make love and then you'll leave me at 6.30 in the morning. And she said, well, you'll go to work at 8.30 and you won't think of me again. That's what they said. And then he said, sing me a song. And that's the only time she came close to smiling, and that's as close to smiling as she got. She met with her mother, she met with her former fiance's mother, who was a good friend of hers, no facial expression whatsoever. Didn't smile through the whole movie. She was lonely, yes, and they kept talking about loneliness. There's a movie about loneliness. No, it's not. It's a movie about depression. This lady is brain dead. <clears throat> he turned the damn television on and there was nothing on and they left it on for like 15 or 20 minutes we've got this flipping television I mean, not flipping you can, but it was actually flipping up and down it was the most irritating thing in the whole wide world and then she sings her song about about two lovers dying in, in, a, in a bed I mean, it was just the most bizarre song I've ever heard. The happy song? It wasn't happy. Well, it starts out, <laughs> I had this I had this really bad job and I work here and I clean the tables and I serve people food and I see a lot of sadness uh, but sometimes lovers will come in and they'll touch each other's hands and then I can imagine them going back to their cold hard room and making love and then the sun comes out and the world is bright again but then they die because they don't have any food. Because they're, I don't know, because of weird smell. Anyway, and she's smiling. Well, almost. That's, that's as close to a smile as she got throughout the whole movie. As weird as that is. French movie. But it turns out she's not French. It turns out she's Belgian. And of course, the Belgians speak French and they speak uh, 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 Dutch. They speak the Dutch language. So the people in the, the north speak Flemish, that's Dutch. The people in the south are Walloons, they speak French. And she speaks French, and it was just the weirdest thing in the world. Her mother lives in Brussels, she lives in Paris, and she kept running into people that spoke almost perfect French. Germans that spoke up. Well, she, she visited Berlin, so she was in Berlin for a while. And she hooks up with this guy, and they start having... <clears throat> Or, or, or going at it, as it were, but they don't actually have sex because she doesn't want to. And so they're, they're, they're rolling around with each other all of a sudden she says, get dressed. <laughs> and then he talks about it, of course he talks about it. Really, really interesting movie. So It's two hours of her walking around making noise with her shoes and uh, just making noise, like whatever. Noise was very alone. important. It was all. It, none of it was white noise. It was all. Like to make it seem like she wasn't alone. Yeah, you speak you French. Mean, she was never alone. She was always in a, a train with other people. Uh, she's she's looking out the window. They're coming into Brussels, and this guy starts having this conversation, and he tells her his life story. He had a girlfriend when he was 13, and she was French, and he was in love with her, and, and she helped him with his French. He's German. She helped him with his French. And then she met a Swedish boy who had bigger muscles than him when he was 13. She, he just starts having this stupid conversation. <laughs> anyway, so really interesting depressed? movie. Like, are you depressed if you do that? You start turning on things because you feel lonely? Right, yeah, you need to fill up. Yeah, you're trying to take the noise away from me. Oh, you do this? Oh my God. Some people go to sleep with the television on at night. I do that. Do that. <laughs> I don't like it too quiet. Okay. 
Yeah. But are, the question is, are you depressed? I don't know. Well, I looking at your face. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think I am. Okay, stand up. No. No, no, stand up. Turn around. Okay. Does she look depressed, you guys? No. No. Okay. <laughs> he said, he said I look like, uh, what did you say earlier? I look dead or something. Like, I look like that lady. Well, that's when you first came in. Yeah, I just like. But you're okay now. <laughs> I was catatonic this, this, uh, this weekend, but, but when I'm with you guys, I'm not catatonic. So I'm okay. Anyway, it was a really an interesting movie. I, I wouldn't watch two hours of this stuff. Well, I did, but. I just had to be like, did you lose the remote or were you depressed? <laughs> <laughs> no. I kept changing channels, but I had it on tape. So every time I came back to it, I went back to the same place I was before. I know. So I watched the whole thing, but it took me like three hours to watch it. So all around was just a bad movie? No, it's a, it's a good movie because it shows loneliness and it shows depression. Is it in English? Or? No, it's in French. So did it have subtitles, or can you speak yeah, French? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I can understand some French, but yeah, I, I'm glad it had subtitles. And some of the subtitles were incorrect. They were saying different things than what the subtitles said. Anyway, Mimi's an Anna. Le rendezvous de Anna. Fascinating movie. Oui, oui. Last weekend it was uh, Japanese movies, and this weekend it was it was this strange movie. Monsieur, really kind of a strange movie. There was mood, nudity in the movie. Now normally mood, nudity, nudity. See, I, I keep saying nudity. Nudity in the movie will really liven things up. In this case, it was almost sad. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was that bad. Um, the only good experience she talked about was uh, a lesbian affair that she had uh, when she was in Italy. Uh, she what the heck are you watching, buddy? Sorry? What the heck are you watching? It was on Turner Classic Movies. It's a classic movie. Oh, Turner has good movies. Yeah. Turner Classic Movies. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Anyway, but, uh, I, I mean, the nudity, instead of being erotic, it was See? not. It wasn't even <laughs> sexy. And she's not that uh, unattractive a woman, but the, oh, oh, I the, wrong the more you see her, I mean, she's not unattractive. That's not, that didn't make any sense. To, she is a fairly attractive individual, but as the movie went on, she became less and less attractive, as weird as that sounds. But I mean, you see somebody that looks like a decapitated head, so who has no, she showed no emotions throughout the entire movie. Is Even that, when she was... Is what's the movie called? Okay. The Meetings of Anna, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because she was traveling from Paris to Berlin, from Berlin to Brussels, from Brussels back to Paris. And so along the way she meets all these people and she talks to them. She's a filmmaker and she's trying to get people to watch her films. It's a really fascinating movie. You know, I saw a movie this weekend, and the guy's expression didn't change through the whole movie either. Until the very end, just a little bit. Did he sing a song, and that's why? No, he, he was cutting somebody's heart out. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> a little bit of a different movie. Than Rambo. 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 <laughs> <laughs> his facial expression didn't change through the whole movie. That's really good. Uh, yeah, and think about it, I he was talking about this. Okay, so let's do Stallone. Either watch Rambo or Meetings with Anna. Both of them are about as grisly. One is as grisly as the other. So she's about to be seduced by her, her ex-boyfriend, who's not her boyfriend anymore. <clears throat> Instead, he gets sick. She, he says, he says, take off your clothes and lay on top of me. And she does, and he says, I feel nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> you go, that's very complimentary. <laughs> anyway, but she, so she goes to the pharmacy to get uh, medicine for this guy, comes home, and she strips him naked, and she starts rubbing him down with things. 
I mean, there's nothing erotic about anything in the whole movie, no matter what happened. It was just the most bizarre thing in the world. Anyway, good movie. So I don't know what's next weekend. I don't know if we're going to see get to see a Chinese movie or whatever. Uh, anyway. See, you can learn a lot of different things by watching foreign films. Uh, Europeans, a lot of times, they don't really show a lot of emotion. And that's, that's something that you need to uh, remember. I was talking about Lutherans before, and Cat we were talking about Catholics. Uh, you, know, you like to think that, that all these people are the same, but the reality is they're all different. And you're going to run into all kinds of interesting things. <coughs> But you need to be prepared for it. Not everybody's the same. Uh, preparing for the client, ending a session. Okay, we're going to talk about, oh, the, the other thing that I need to tell you is uh, we're, you need to have uh, 10 counseling sessions. Um, this is the sixth week, uh, but there are 17 weeks in the semester for some unre horrible reason. <coughs> Uh, so we need at least 10 counseling sessions. Uh, so you need to get your paper done, you need to get your, your history done of, your, of the character that you're going to have. Okay, you just need to do that. I've got four now, I think. I just got one. Yeah. How long the, the character thing needs to be? Uh, the paper has to be five pages long. It's so what By is history? The history? The history is just filling out all that, that, that history form that I sent you. Okay, do you still have that? You need it. I, I, uh, okay. you know. <laughs> what is that due? Uh, it's due before we start counseling. Now, if you don't have your character before we start counseling, you're not going to be able to function. You're not going to be able to be counseled if you don't have a character. Okay. And we can't counsel you because that's not right. Yeah, I think I need that too. Yeah, I could get in a lot of trouble. We try to counsel somebody. So. You need to come up with a character that doesn't have anything to do with any problems that you potentially have ever had. <clears throat> you could be Anna. No, just kidding. <laughs> or the Japanese guy. The Japanese girl. Always so emotional. But then they're always so controlled. Everything's very controlled. Uh, I was watching that Japanese movie. Everybody's sloop for the death in Japan. So they're always walking with their feet up. Yeah, that's really weird. Or so different Japanese sulfur people. Sulfur means they point their toes out from their bodies. <coughs> so straight ahead or pigeon toe. Anyway, okay, so we're preparing for the client. The practitioner must get ready to meet with clients. <clears throat> they must gather uh, referral information. You need to gather forms that they, they may potentially need. Uh, you need to to put together all the supplies that you may, may need uh, for this client. Uh, the purpose or agenda for the meeting is clarified. You know why you're there. Uh, this person has, has uh, hired you to talk to them. Uh, this, and, and of course, you need to come up with a, an agenda. This is something that we have every time we have meetings. They always send out an agenda. <clears throat> Uh, the practitioner must consider the client's needs and, and the physical arrangement of the building. Uh, the waiting room, is it adequate? If they have a wheelchair, uh, is there access to your office? Uh, can they get into the building? Uh, the waiting room, is the waiting room configured correctly? Do you need to move things around? Are things too close? Uh, do you need to move things out of the way so that your client can get his wheelchair in there? Uh, the meeting room, is the meeting room adequate? Is the doorway wide enough for the client to get into? Or are you going to have to change rooms uh, so that they can get in? Th these are things that you need to, uh, to uh, think about before the client gets there. Uh, the more prepared you are, the more it looks like you know what you're doing. Uh, the less prepared you are, the less it looks like you know what you're doing. Uh, just because if your client is actually in a wheelchair, and uh, your office is not uh, wheelchair accessible, you're going to look stupid. You're going to look like you don't care. 
And in essence, if you haven't figured this out before they get there, then you really don't care. So this is just uh, a trick that you can use to fool the client into thinking that you care about them. So do you need a bigger office then? I'm sorry? Do you need a bigger office? You're, you may have to meet in a, a meeting room. Uh, you you know, a, a, a a conference room. Oh, okay. Where I was for. If the client has any physical limitations, then the practitioner must make appropriate alterations. Uh, if the client uh, is uh, using a cane, you don't want them walking up the stairs. Okay. So these are just things that you need to think about uh, before the client gets there. <clears throat> The client's culture should be considered to ensure that all appropriate steps are taken to make the session as beneficial as possible. Uh, I used to work with a lady from Afghanistan. <clears throat> she was a doctor, she, but she was not working as a doctor. Not in the United States, damn it, she couldn't get her license. Anyway, she, so I did nice things for her and she invited me over for a meal. Uh, we had uh, goat's head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which probably sounds good to you, but remember, I can't eat that. So. Um, and uh, since I was the honored guest, guess which part of the goat I got? The head. Well, no, that, that brain. It was all. I got the eyeball. I got the eyeball. I mean, theoretically, I'm supposed to eat both eyeballs, but uh, that is me. Uh, I'm not an eyeball guy, for one thing. and I'm certainly not a goat head guy. It was uh, it was a goat's head on a field of rice. Well, the rice was good. Uh, they use a lot of really weird spices. I mean, different spices. A lot of strong tasting things. I'm kind of a salt and pepper kind of guy, and all that basil and whatever else she had on there, cardamom or whatever. Anyway. Did you eat it? I did because, of course, I, and I ate the eyeball too, okay? Because it was offered to me. Yeah. And her husband had the other eyeball, so I know. It was weird. Her husband didn't have a job. Her husband didn't have a, a, a skill. He married a doctor. And his job was to t make sure that uh, she was taken care of and that nobody took advantage of her. It's really kind of weird. Anyway, uh, so that was a, a, an interesting experience. If the practitioner does not have a working knowledge of the client culture, then it is appropriate to research the culture with the understanding that such writing is often stereotyped and inaccurate. Uh, so uh, thinking that you're going to read, uh, to be able to read uh, uh, Tony Hillerman and understand the Navajo is not very, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, he's just giving you an idea. So whether you're reading a a book about China or Korea or whatever, whatever the culture is, a lot of times you get a negative, you get more of a stereotyped uh, idea, but it's good to understand that, that this is a possibility. Uh, so, I mean, if you, there are some fairly negative uh, uh, books out there about Scientology, there are negative things, there's a, there was a negative television show, uh, what was her name, Rimini, what was her first name? Leah. Leah, yeah, mm -hmm. Leah Remini. Uh, yeah, she, that was, that was fairly devastating as far as Scientology is concerned. Uh, I have seen uh, negative television shows about Mormons, seen negative television shows about, uh, about Catholics. It gives, just gives you an idea about what's going on. Okay. But you have to understand that not everybody's the same, and, and a lot of these are stereotyped, and it may be uh, relatively inaccurate. The reason they wrote the the book is was to uh, uh, was to, to say something negative about the, the religion, but it just gives you an idea. Okay. Uh, so we need to figure out uh, what they eat. So we need to figure out uh, what can we offer them. Uh, if you're in Japan, I'm trying to think what they used to offer us. Uh, egg roll. No, it wasn't egg rolls. It was um, uh, seaweed, rolled rice and seaweed. I don't know if you've ever tasted seaweed, but it's it's, good. it's bitter. It's it ain't sweet. I'm looking for cookies or donuts, or they don't serve you sweets because they didn't have anything sweet in Japan. They didn't evolve that way. Uh, the practitioner needs to understand how the seaweed is good, 
Who said that? You guys get F's for the day. You get F's for the day. <laughs> well, I had it with um, Spam. I had it called Mutsubi. It's um, Hawaiian sushi. It's also Korean sushi. Really? Korean, yeah, Koreans well, eat a lot of sushi. I think Hawaiian shit. <laughs> it's, it's really good for yeah. Spam and seaweed. It's oh, really God. good. <laughs> See, I used to, we used to get Spam in our sea rush. <laughs> it's almost ham. It's not quite as salty as ham. Like like <laughs> it's got a lot more <laughs> fat in it. Ham, that's usually. The practitioner needs to understand how the client may feel about the first meeting. They may feel embarrassed, hesitant, uncomfortable. Of course they do. Uh, they don't know who you are. You don't know who they are. Uh, they're coming in for a problem, and therefore they're feeling vulnerable. Uh, so they're not going to be very positive about the first meeting, potentially. The practitioner must put away all distracting thoughts so that they can concentrate on the needs of their client. You need to be able to read this person. Uh, they may come in all dressed up, and that will probably tell you, geez, do you usually wear that much makeup? What, what's going on here? <clears throat> so you need to, to understand uh, how the client's feeling. Beginning the first meeting appropriately is essential to the client-practitioner relationship. First, first impressions have lasting effects on, the, on future interactions. The greeting is essential to connecting with this select individual. So you should always greet them uh, in a positive manner. First impressions. Uh, ground rules need to be clarified. Uh, the purpose of the meeting, why are, why are we here? Uh, how long is the meeting going to be? Normally they pay by the hour. Uh, if they go over the hour, they pay for two hours. And that's something that they need to understand. Any special considerations that need to be addressed? Um, do we need to have any, anything in the, in the office? Do you need water? Do you need tea? Uh, no alcoholic beverages probably, but you can have a Coke, um, you know, coffee, cup of coffee. Uh, how do you like, how do you take your coffee? These kinds of things need to be determined uh, at, during the first meeting. When greeting the client, be aware of loudness of your voice, <laughs> eye contact, and how you address them. Uh, I only have one complain about Jeremiah, or my colleague, the other psychology instructor. He talks really quiet. He talks really quiet, which is okay, but my hearing's not that good, okay? <laughs> so he's, he's really kind of quiet. And if you have a conversation with him, he gets quieter and quieter and quieter. So when you have class with Jeremiah, potentially what's going to happen is he's going to start out at a certain level, but he's going to get quieter as his lecture goes along. Just a hint. Nothing bad. It's just that he's a quiet speaker. He, he talks quiet. But he's a counselor, and this is the way counselors do things. They want their clients to listen to them. So a lot of times they won't speak a lot, very loudly, so the, the client has to concentrate in order to hear them. I know, it's a trick. Yeah, I saw that before. It actually worked. It was weird. Yeah, it, it does work. Um, well, we'll go into that. Okay. Yeah. Women use this technique. Sue does this from time to time. Okay, but Sue's not with us anymore, so we don't have to worry about not hearing what she's saying or not hearing whatever it is at the end of her sentence. Uh, issues of privacy and confidentiality are important in how uh, you first meet your client. Uh, so you need, to, you need to get them to understand that just because this is, uh, they are your client doesn't mean that uh, all of the information they give you is confidential. There are certain circumstances where that, this information uh, will be, can be disclosed to select an other individuals. Uh, normally if you are in a practice and there are a number of counselors, a lot of times you'll get together with the other counselors and discuss your clients. Uh, you know, five heads are, are better than one head. Or maybe uh, you're a subordinate and you have a, there's a team leader or a head counselor. A lot of times you'll have to give them information about your clients so that you can, you can all talk about the clients together. Now the problem with counselors, and this is something that you're going to come in contact with, You've already come in contact with it. I talk about 
about Sue from time to time, but a lot of times they won't agree on, on a lot of different things. It happens. You put two psychologists in a, in a, a room together and they're going to disagree about lots of things. Uh, they're going to disagree about reading people. There's a lot of disagreement that potentially can take place. Why are we talking about this? We're talking about confidentiality. Uh, if you must identify a person in a waiting room uh, and cannot guess who your client might be, uh, you can say very quietly, I'm Jesse Melendez, are you Mrs. Chin? Ms. Chin, I'm sorry. So, if you need to identify people, and that working in medicine, of course, I had to do this all the time. You have to call somebody into the office. Uh, so, usually, uh, I, always, I always used both names uh, when I was working in Oklahoma. Uh, the uh, person that I worked with knew everybody. She knew everybody, so she called them by their first name. But I didn't. I didn't know anybody, so I called. I, I uh, pronounced both names. And sometimes I got it wrong. Uh, it turns out that in Oklahoma, you don't call people by their first name. You call them by call them by their middle name. I know. So if you're Bobby Joe, you call him Joe. Not Bobby Joe. Not Bob. But I always said Bobby Johnson, you know. Oh, they call me Bobby Joe, or call me Joe, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and you pronounce, mispronounce words, names from, them from time to time. I'm pretty good at it, actually. I tend to be okay. <laughs> Somebody called me on the phone the other day. Uh, their name was Peshlaki. That's the way she pronounced it anyway. And that's the way I was pronouncing it. I was shocked that I got it. I know. I was kind of surprised. I had a person uh, come in one time. Her name was uh, R O A R K E. Rourke. Rourke. Yeah, it's a good Irish name. It's a good Irish name, you know. Rourke. Rourke. It's a good Irish name. I think we've seen it in movies from time to time. You know, Charlie Rourke. He's a good guy. You know. Kevin Rourke. Anyway, so I, I said, you know, Ida, Ida Rourke. And boy, I'll tell you what, she just about took my head off. Because she's from the South. And Southerners don't like the Irish. Because Southerners identify with English, and the English don't like the Irish. So she pronounced her name instead of Rourke, like everybody and their cousin would pronounce that name. She pronounced her name Roark because that's the English pronunciation of Rourke. Jeez. So did you get Sosie right when you came out here? Sosie, yeah. S-O-S-I-E? Yeah. You actually got right. I got Sosie right, but uh, I was watching television, uh, and it was, I can't remember, it was a bull episode. And uh, they went to some place in the Northeast, and there was a person by the name of Sosie, and they pronounced it Saucy. I know, but it was the, all the damn Canadians up there. <laughs> they can't pronounce names anyway. But the person's name was Saucy, and they pronounced it Saucy. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I just had an argument with uh, somebody about Johnny Baia. They were pronouncing, Irene pronounces the Bia, and your dad. Just about took my head off because I pronounced it B because that's the way Irene pronounces it. But he said it was by. Is it by or B? By. 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 Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'll go slap Irene. <laughs> Just kidding. I wouldn't touch Irene. She would take my head off. If a reception, he just told me I was incorrect. He didn't take my head off. I was just kidding. Your dad's too nice to. <laughs> to do something like that. If a receptionist is able to identify your client, uh, you can just identify yourself uh, to the client. Uh, be aware that many clients experience some shame in seeking help, so confidentiality is very important. They won't want you pronouncing their name uh, out there uh, in, the, in the waiting room, especially if there's a number of people. If they're the only ones, it doesn't really make any difference, but a lot of people are embarrassed by the fact that they're going to see a counselor. Uh, the practitioner should invite the client to introduce themselves. Uh, the practitioner should determine how the client wants to be addressed. Uh, some people don't like to use their first names. Where I come from, 
we, we have to use people's first names. Uh, they don't want you to use their last names. Uh, some places, they only use people's last names. Uh, you, they, they don't call them Mr., they don't call them Mrs., they call them you know, Johnson. Johnson, come here. Where I come from, if you call somebody by just their last name, <clears throat> Mr. or Doctor or whatever in front of it, it means I want to fight. It means we're going to fight. We're going to, you know, Bradway, come here. That means, that means Bradway's going to either punch this guy or get punched by this guy. But that's where I come from. I mean, it's a totally different situation. Um, having been in the military and wandered around the world as much as I have, you know, these, it all depends on where you are. In the South, you use people's last names all the time. In Oklahoma, you use their middle name. You never, and half the time, you don't know what their middle name is. So, you know, you know Bob Johnson. Oh, call me Bubba. You know, well, I didn't. It's his nickname. I doesn't say that on his chart. Nobody calls me Bob. Everybody calls me Bubba. Using the last name in any circumstance shows respect. So usually it's a, it's Mr. Johnson. No matter where you are, you can put a uh, a qualifier in front of it, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mrs. Ms. Johnson, uh, be careful with females because uh, sometimes they're married, sometimes they're not. And if you call somebody Mrs. when they're a Miss, or a Miss when they're a Mrs., sometimes they get offended. So now we use Ms. instead of Miss or Mrs. Because we don't know. Or maybe they're divorced, or maybe you never know. Anyway, so use, use a Mr. in front of it. Are you Mr. Jones? Oh, that's my dad. Everybody calls me Bob. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people tend to feel more comfortable with professionals uh, who fully explain the process, uh, what they're going to do, what will be expected uh, of each person participating, uh, the purpose of the meeting, limits of confidentiality. All of this needs to come out in the first meeting. You need to talk about who you are, and what's going to happen next. When beginning meetings with children and adolescents, explanations will need to be made uh, that they can understand. So you need to understand what they understand. Uh, if you use too, too large of words or you use terms that don't make any sense to them, uh, they're, not going to, they're not going to ask you what you're talking about, uh, especially if they're shy. They, they certainly will they'll act like they know what's going on. Uh, special is issues of confidentiality will need to be covered. Uh, education about your role is important as well as what you expect of them. Uh, how, you in, in, how you will include their parents or caretakers also needs to be made clear. Uh, a lot of times they're coming in for maybe uh, they uh, attempted suicide. <clears throat> uh, in which case, uh, you're supposed to check in with their parents from time to time. Uh, anything that they disclose. Now this gets a little uh, dicey sometimes because sometimes they're talking about uh, they've been abused by a select individual. Uh, and this can become extremely controversial, especially if it's a young lady and the uh, mother has a boyfriend. The mother has a boyfriend, she is not going to want uh, to lose that boyfriend. So if, uh, if you, if, uh, the individual indicates that uh, her, the mother's boyfriend's been coming on to her, uh, then the mother's not going to want to hear that at all, potentially. Or maybe if you tell them that she'll kick the guy out, but you just never know what's going to happen next. All too often, uh, what will happen is the mother will choose the boyfriend over the daughter. Happens all the time, unfortunately. So you have to be really, 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 really careful. Uh, potentially, the daughter will, uh, will know uh, whether the mother will accept this idea or not. The fact that the boyfriend is, is hitting on her or whatever. Or potentially has done something. <clears throat> so who's more important, the boyfriend or the daughter? <laughs> Obviously, it's the boyfriend. It's more important than the daughter. <laughs> it all depends on who you're talking to. Uh, first meetings with groups and families, be sure that the members of a group are acquainted with each other. Uh, clarify ground rules for talking, who gets to talk first. 
Uh, some groups use talking sticks where they have something that they pass back and forth. Uh, the person who is holding the stick is the individual that gets the talk. Uh, explain what the role of participants will be. Uh, in families, you may want to ask how the members want the family to be different. Yes, sir. Um, I think you can go back just a little bit to uh, when you're talking about working with children yeah. or with minors. If, uh, if you have, I was just wondering where, uh, how HIPAA comes into play as far as like if the child is like 13, 14, 15, and they're talking about things of this nature, they don't want their mother there or they don't want their father right. there. Yeah, and that's. If that's the only way you can get this information, then that's what you have to do. Well, usually they say that um, the child, once they reach the age of 12, they're able to make that decision. Right. Right. Oh, okay. so Depending on the state. Yeah, the nurse will ask. Yeah. Depending you want your mom or dad here to hear right. what we talk about. And if the child says yes, the parent can see Yeah, if they're under the age of 12 in some states, yeah. you have to have another adult in the room. But usually it's not the mom, or well, it can be the parent. Uh, but a lot of times it's that parent that is the problem. If, if that parent is that close to that kid that they want to be in the room with the child, then potentially they're the problem anyway. And this gets really strange, because uh, before the age of 12, the child can't say no to the parent I'm by law. So it gets, it gets real strange. That's why uh, working with children is so difficult. A lot of people won't do it. It's just too, too difficult. Yes, sir. What about the other extreme when you're working with elders? If they're having trouble comprehending? Those? Right, right. If they potentially have dementia? Yeah. Yeah. What you probably will want to do is have somebody else in the room. Um, yeah. Someone that they know? Uh, it doesn't have to be somebody that they know. Um, Even if they know that they tend to forget them, right? That right. Yeah. That, that can, can be the way it is. Um, sometimes they'll, the only person they'll remember is their spouse, and they will forget their children. <coughs> uh, sometimes it's the other way around. Um, I've watched known, the notebook? I'm sorry? Have you watched the notebook? I don't know. I've never seen the notebook. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, it seems like, like with elder abuse, um, if they're being abused, it would be by their primary caretaker, someone's with right. them all the time, being frustrated. Right. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be. It can be somebody that just comes over every once in a while, trying to intimidate them or get their money or get them to change their wills or whatever. I mean, these kinds of things happen from time to time. We had a situation one time, uh, this is when I was in Oklahoma. Um, there was an individual that owned like half the town. I mean, it's just kind of weird. Uh, but uh, she only remembered, um, she had six kids, and five of them she was close to, and one of them she wasn't close to. And the only person, the only individual, her spouse was gone. Uh, the only person that she remembered was the kid that she didn't like. <laughs> so the other the other kids were coming in and taking care of her. She couldn't remember anybody's name. Didn't remember any of the grandkids. The only per people that the only person that she remembered was the kid that was had always been a bad kid, and and his children. He had had like four or five kids uh, by different women. I mean, it was just kind of bizarre. I remember that happened. Um, I came across this elder, this elderly lady, mm -hmm. and I knew the family. And I think it was like a, a dinner that I attended, and um, she had dementia. And she's sitting at the, the chair right, right in front of me. She starts talking to me now. And she's telling me about where she grew up, how she grew up in the area, you know, where she herded her sheep when she was a little girl. And she's telling me this, and the family came out, and they were mad. Like, they were like, don't listen to her, don't listen to her. If she tells you anything, it's, it's a lie, it's a lie, don't listen to her. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They don't understand Navajo. Oh. So they're like trying to tell me not to listen to her. And I said, she's not talking about any of you. I said, she's telling me about her, this is her area, this is where she grew up. And they, they were... Defensive. They thought that she was saying stuff about them, and then um, 
I didn't say anything to the grandma. I was just listening to the family. <coughs> they were coming out at me. And um, finally, um, they came out and they were like, she's got dementia. And I said, okay. I said, I know that. And then they were like, um, she tried to run away from us last night. And they said, we tied her down. We used the duct tape. Oh, oh and gosh. it pissed me off. You know, I got so mad. I, just, I, I mean, I cussed them out. You know, I was like, what the, the you know, you know, blah blah. blah. Yeah, and I, I went all, out the, all those army words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up arguing with the family over how they treated her and how they were yelling at her. They were yelling at her right in front of me, telling her to shut up, shut up, grandma, shut up. You know. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? you know, I, I was mad. I was That's, so mad. And so um, it hurt that I had to leave the grandma there. But what I did was I ended up writing a letter. And I explained word for word what they told me, how they told me, the way they treated me. And I took it into the social services. I took it into the hospital and to where the, the, the head of the household I took it into the house. Oh wow! And I, I wrote them all up, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stand for this. So I ended up doing that. And what had happened was um, the hospital just needed another letter supporting that the elder was being abused. Oh my God! So because of that letter that I turned in, the grandma was able, they were able to take the grandma out. Yeah. So what was this? Like? Huh? What was that? Um, it was around. It was oh, around. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It was I thought an actual, it, no, so it was an actual. were you working during the time, or did you just visit? No, I was visiting. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, I was oh, visiting. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It was interesting, yeah. yeah. And it was really sad, you know. It happens, you know. And You can get in trouble with families that way. Oh, yeah. I did. Yeah. yeah. I did. I didn't care. I said, go ahead and say what you have to say to me. I don't care. Yeah. It doesn't hurt me. You're hurting the grandma. Right. Eventually, the grandma passed away mm -hmm. um, not long ago. And then I recently was talking to one of the family members, and he's talking about, oh, I really miss my grandma. I wish you didn't go. I, I wish you, you know. I just, I had to ignore it. <laughs> it just, it turned well, you didn't want to punch me. Yeah. That wouldn't do anybody. Yeah. You just standing there. I know. It's like, like oh, I'm joking. <laughs> so it is different. And every, every situation is going to be different. And sometimes you're going to run into some really strange uh, family um, dynamics. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was a nice way to say it. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, in families, you may want to ask uh, how the members of the family want to be, uh, how they want to be different, how they, do they want to change the family structure, the, the, do they want to change the family dynamic. Uh, confidentiality needs to be discussed and an agreement uh, reached about how information will be shared outside the group or the family. All right. Uh, for subsequent sessions, some practitioners like to start their sessions by allowing the client to initiate the conversation thus setting the direction of the meeting. I mean, uh, there is no right or wrong way of doing this. Either you can set the agenda or they can set the agenda. Uh, it all depends on what their problem is. Uh, if they're obsessive compulsive, then you'd never want them to set the agenda. Because if they set the agenda, it's gonna be the same thing every time. They will, they'll wanna talk about exactly the same thing. And it's usually not what, the pro what their problem is, not their obsessions. Uh, they may say, where would you like to start? Uh, let's begin by discussing the progress you've made since our last meeting. Uh, it really all depends on what the problem of the client is and what kind of a client they are, what their problem potentially is. Confidentiality is one of the most important elements to address at the beginning of the first meeting. Uh, you need to as assure clients that information shared with you will be kept confidential. It will be kept secure, it will not be shared with others unless they sign a consent form. It all depends on the state. In some states, they have to sign a consent form for anybody that gets this information. Uh, so they have to agree, yes, I can, I, I, you can discuss your case with uh, your colleagues, uh, yes, you can discuss the case with my spouse, yes, you can discuss the case with my, with my parents or whatever. <clears throat> 
So they have to sign a consent form for anybody that gets that information. <clears throat> now, some organizations, uh, counseling uh, groups, uh, they'll have to sign a form giving uh, the uh, uh, individual the right to discuss their case with, with everybody at, the, uh, at that business. And that's, it's boilerplate. It's just the first thing that they sign is this uh, consent form allowing you to discuss their case with somebody else. It's just the way it works. All depends on the organization. Some organizations demand this. Uh, and if they won't sign the form, then they can't be counseled by, by you. They'll have to go someplace else. Uh, if you go down to Phoenix, the probability of you not signing this form is fairly remote. So you'll not be able to find anybody who will counsel you unless you sign a consent form allowing them to discuss your case with somebody else. You won't be able to find that person. Los Angeles, same thing. You'll never, ever just be able to talk to one person. They will always want you to sign a consent form. New York City, Chicago. Uh, the big cities are this way because, uh, because of liability is one reason why they do this. <clears throat> one of the hardest areas for clients to understand is mandated reporting of possible harm uh, to self or others. So if they say that they're, they've been thinking of suicide, uh, you can't just let that go. Uh, he's just talking today. Because if they commit suicide, that's a mean. Yeah, it's, he just committed a crime. Um, if they talk about uh, them committing a crime, you have to disclose that information. So there's some things that all you will always disclose. Uh, if they have been talking about neglecting their children or child abuse, you have to disclose that information too. Uh, elder abuse that always comes out. That always yeah, you can't let them get away with that. Uh, begin your discussion of confidentiality by covering the legal limits of your state. And every state is different. Uh, some of the southern states, uh, they don't have to disclose hardly anything. Only the courts can get this information. In other states, uh, if they, uh, well, in, uh, in all states, as we saw from the Tarasov uh, case, well, that's a different class, isn't it? Uh, the Tarasov case, uh, uh, an individual came in to see his counselor, the counselor, uh, he told the counselor that uh, he was thinking of murdering this girl that wouldn't respond to him. Uh, he was, he was going to kill her. And if the counselor didn't do anything. Well, he did do something. He called the campus police and they had this guy in lockdown for 24 hours. But then they let him go. And guess what happened next? Well, he murdered the girl. He said he was going to murder her. And now in California, well not just in California, but with all counselors, if somebody tells you that they want to do somebody harm, you have to disclose that information to the individual that they have threatened. <clears throat> now the question is, what about Facebook? Or what about Twitter? What if somebody threatens to go kill somebody on Facebook? Which I've been threatened myself. I know. What if they threaten uh, to assassinate the uh, president? <laughs> no, anytime they say this, you have to let them go. I mean, you have to, uh, you have to disclose that information. Okay, it is time to stop. So, thank you for not not only the Good story, I like that. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike.